I'm incredibly nervous to uh, talk in front of you because you've got to be one of the most formidable people that I've ever heard of or ever listened to or ever seen. So my question is, again, you're one of the best communicators that I've ever listened to. If I could be half as good at you or at communicating as you are, I would be set. How can I teach myself to do that? Practice. You know, really, like, well, there's a couple of things. Is helps to read a lot. It really helps to write. So if you want to make yourself articulate, which is a very good idea, then not only should you read, but you should write down what you think. And if you can do that a little bit every day, 15 minutes, maybe you could steal 15 minutes and do it every day. But if you do that for 10 years, you really straighten out your thinking. If you're going to speak effectively, you have to know way more than you're talking about. You know, so if you, this is often difficult for beginning lectures at university because they'll do a lecture on a topic, but they only know as much as they're saying in the lecture. And they get kind of stuck to their notes because of it. But you want to know 10 times as much as you are saying in the lecture, and then you can specify a stepping path through it and elaborate with the other things that you know. But to do that, you have to do a lot of reading. But you also have to do a lot of reading because that's where the synthesize that's where the synthesizing comes. So that's on the input side. And then on the output side, well there's some tricks, techniques, let's say, is like if you're speaking in front of a group, you are not delivering a talk to a group. That's not what you're doing. The talk isn't a packaged thing that you present to a group. There isn't a group. There's a bunch of individuals. And you talk to them. So when I talk to a group, I always talk to people one at a time. And that makes it easier too, because you know how to talk to a person. It's like, can you talk to a thousand people? Well, probably not, because it's too intimidating. But there isn't a thousand people there. There's a thousand individuals. And so you just look at an individual and you say something and you can tell if they're engaged, they look confused or they look interested or they look angry or they look bored or maybe they're asleep, in which case you look at someone else. And they, they give you feedback about how you're doing. And so one thing is to, to have something to say, yeah. But the next thing is pay attention to who you're talking to. Because unless you're very badly socialized, and that seems unlikely in your case, because you know you present yourself at least moderately well, you know. And well, I mean I don't know you very well, but on first but on first sight, you know, you're you're doing fine. So the probability that if you pay attention to the individuals that you're talking to, that your natural wealth of, of social skill will manifest itself is extremely high. And so you don't deliver a talk to an audience. That's a really bad way of thinking about it. You're actually engaged in a conversation with an audience. Even if they're not talking, they're nodding and shifting position and, you know, looking like this or and you can you can pull all that in and and, and use it to govern the level at which you're addressing the entire audience. The last thing I would say is, well, having the aim to be a good communicator is a good start. And you think, well, I could buttress that to some degree. Well, there isn't anything that you can possibly, this is the whole point of a liberal education. There isn't anything that you can possibly do that makes you more competent in everything you do than to learn how to communicate. I don't care if you're going to be a carpenter. I mean, being a carpenter, by the way, is very difficult, especially if you're a good carpenter. But if you're good at communicating as a carpenter, you're like 10 times better as a carpenter. So the and this is something that the liberal arts colleges, I think, have, I don't know if they've forgotten it, but they don't do a very good job of marketing. It's like, well, what's the use of a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of arts? It's like, well, you can think, you can write, you can speak, you've read something like the economic value of that is incalculable the people that I've watched in my life who've been spectacularly successful are they have skills clearly that that's a minimum precondition but they're also very very good at articulating themselves and so whenever they negotiate they're successful well that's kind of like the definition of success in life right you negotiate and you're it doesn't mean you win because if you're a good negotiator if you're a really good negotiator, 
everybody walks away from the negotiation thrilled. And so then people line up to do things with you. So, and that's all, that's all dependent on your ability to communicate. Read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man, you've got this four year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it's, it's given you an identity, like a high quality identity and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got a, you've got a respectable identity, university student and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And you know, and, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you, you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power, and I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill, and your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation into something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way, but, it, it, <laughs> but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what universities should be calling forth. It's like, God, you people, you, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or, or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities, and they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think, learn to speak, learn to read. It makes you a superpower, an individual superpower. You have, it, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for really thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here. Man, they're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age, but you're still bloody old. Would you, <laughs> would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course, older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty stricken, po poverty stricken when you're 70. So I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are, you're here on a heroic mission 
You're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile. And, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except, you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well send your boys to trade school because at least they'll learn something useful. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. Take a bit of a look at yourself and think about what's not so good that you could improve that you should improve by your own standards and that you would improve you know and set yourself a little goal um you know maybe you're not studying at all at, at, at your university or maybe you're maybe you're at work and you've got this stack of paper there you know and you haven't looked at that damn stack for like a month and you know that you should be and you're bo bothering yourself at night because you're avoiding that it's like maybe think well, I've avoided that stack of paper completely for one month. I'm quite a coward when it comes to whatever snakes might be hidden in that stack of paper. How about tomorrow I just like put that stack of paper in front of me on my desk and I like I glance through it for 15 seconds. See if I can do that. It's like well you set yourself a goal of improvement you know it's a humble goal because Really, are you such a coward that the best that you can bloody well manage after a month of avoidance is 15 seconds of exposure to a stack of paper? You know, it could easily be. You've been avoiding it. So you're obviously afraid of it. And so the situation could be that dismal and dire. And you might think, well, geez, it's no bomb to my ego. It's no, it's, it's no, it's not fostering the, the strength of my ego to recognizing myself someone who could only withstand 15 seconds of exposure to that thing I'm afraid of and so that's a form of humility too it's like there's things you could do to improve and you know what they are and there's small steps that you could take that you might take that would put you in that direction and then the question is are you big enough to take those small steps you know are you capable of grappling with the fact that you're fundamentally flawed to the point where you have to break things down into almost childlike steps in order to manage them. And the answer to that is, yeah, you are. And that's the lot of, I don't know if it's the lot of everyone. Most people have things they avoid, you know, and they're afraid of. So I would say to some degree, it's the lot of everyone. People vary in the degree to which they've conquered that. And you do meet people from time to time who are extraordinarily disciplined. But most of the time they've got disciplined in exactly this manner. It's through slow incremental improvement. And then you challenge yourself. It's like, well, could I do this? That would be better. And you find out and then you think, well, is there something slightly larger and more challenging that I could do that would be better? And, and you try it and you find out. And as you try it and you find out Generally, you get better at it and you can take on larger and larger challenges. In any case, people do waste a lot of time and they, are, they also act counterproductively a lot of the time. Regardless, we do make progress and, 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 and we can thrive under the difficult conditions that make up our lives and we can resist the malevolence that entices us. That's within our power. And we don't know the limits to that. And we also know that it's better to, we all know this, that it's better to live courageously than cowardly. Everyone knows that. That's what you teach people that you love. And, and, and we know that it's better to live truthfully than in deceit. And you can tell that too, because that's also what you tell people that you love. And we know that you should pick up your damn responsibility and move forward. Everyone knows that. It's, 
It's part of our intrinsic moral nature. And that nature is there. And it's not difficult to communicate to people about this. Like everyone knows that you wake up at three in the morning when you've left, let your life go off the rails and that you berate yourself for your uselessness and your cruelty and your failure to take off to take the opportunities that are in front of you. And if you were the master in your own house, in some sense, the captain of your own destiny, if there was no intrinsic nature, well, that would never happen. You'd just let yourself off the hook. There'd be no voice of conscience tormenting you. But no one escapes from that. And what that indicates is, to me is that, at least psychologically, we live in a universe that's characterized by a moral dimension, and we understand that well, and that moral failings have consequences, and that they're not trivial. They destroy you. They destroy your family. They destroy your community. And, and you can tell people that, and they listen because they know. They don't know they know. That's the thing, and maybe that's the thing about being an, an intellectual. You, you have the opportunity to articulate ideas that other people know, they embody, but they can't articulate. And that's what people tell me, you know, they say, well, you help me give words to things that I always knew to be true, but couldn't say. Or, or they say, I've been trying to put some of your precepts into practice, responsibility being a main one, vision another, honesty, I, I suppose, bringing up the pack and saying, and this is the fun part of doing all of this. Fun is a weak word that it's, 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 a, it's the remarkable part of doing all this. I mean, I have people tell me constantly wherever I go, it's so delightful that, you know, they were in a pretty dark place and they tell me why. And there's plenty of dark places in the world. And they decided, well, maybe they were gonna develop a bit of a vision and take a bit more responsibility and start telling the truth and putting some effort into something. And they come up and they say, well, you can't believe how much better things are. You really want to solve a complicated problem. Maybe you try to solve it a hundred ways and then you take the best solution. Got it. And look, this happens to entrepreneurs all the time too. You know, like most entrepreneurs, this is something to know. Well, most entrepreneurs, most creative people fail at producing their creative product and monetizing it, right? So your default position, if you're a creative person, is you're gonna fail. And so, and that's because it's hard to come up with something new and it's, and it's hard to present it to the market at the right time and it's hard to market it. Like those things are really, really difficult. And so what successful entrepreneurs do is they just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And eventually, if they're fortunate, one of their ideas happens to hit the right place at the right time. And so that's also Dar Darwinian in mm -hmm. some sense. You know, you're creating all these little enterprises that are sort of alive. They're, they're run by people after all. And, even if your idea is good, that doesn't mean it will be successful. There's so many things that have to be taken into account. So this is partly why persistence and that's part of conscientiousness is so useful. It's like, you know, what do they say? If, if at first you fail, then try, try again. And, um, and I, that would probably mean try something different rather than the same thing. But persistence is helpful because it enables you to run many, many experiments. And, and you need to know that the baseline is failure. You know, it's important because otherwise you'll blame that on yourself. I would say for the last 45 years, we've told psychologists have been, have been certainly to blame for this, at least in part. You're okay the way you are. That's what we tell young people. Oh, you're okay the way you are. It's like, and there's nothing worse than you can tell, that you can tell someone who's young than that, especially if they're miserable. You know, and lots of them, well, if they're miserable and aimless, it's like, oh, I'm miserable and aimless, and sometimes I'm suicidal and I'm nihilistic and I don't have any direction in your life, it's in my life. It's like, well, you're okay the way you are here. And it's like, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, look, you know, you're, and you know this, you're useless. You know nothing. You haven't got started. 
You've got 60 years to put yourself together and God only knows what you could become. And that's so, that message is so much more, it's so funny because it's so, it's such an attack, but it's so positive because there's faith there in the, in the potential that makes up the person rather than the miserable actuality that happens to be manifesting itself at the moment. And young people respond extraordinarily well to that because, and you know that if you're a parent and you love your, your child, your son, your daughter, what you're trying to foster is the best in them. You want that to manifest itself across the course of their life. You want them to become continually more than they are to see what they could be. And well, and I think that's part of the great message of the West is that that's, that's, the, that's the ethical requirement of individual being in, in, in the proper sense is to constantly note that you're not what you could be, to take responsibility for that and to, and to commit yourself like body and soul to the attainment of that ideal. The first thing I think you need to understand is that these people that you're comparing yourself to, you don't really know very well, you know, and um, what that means is that you see their shiny outside, but you don't see the reality of their life. And so what you're... You know, maybe you're in California, see someone speeding down the road in a, in a convertible Porsche and you think, oh man, what a lucky bastard. And um, the truth of the matter is that he's thinking about wrapping his expensive sports car around the next cement pillar that he comes close to. You know, you, you can't tell and people have hard lives and, and even people who are comparatively fortunate have hard lives. And so the, the ideal that you're observing that makes you jealous and resentful is in large part an illusion that's created by your own mind. And I... You know, I, I can give you just one example. Is like I know a fair number of extremely wealthy people and um, most of them, most of the people I happen to know are people who've made them, their money themselves. And I tell you, man, they have a burden of responsibility that would, would crush me, would, would crush the typical person. They're, they're just working flat out, like 90 hours a week. And they have thousands of people depending on them. And, you know, they have their money and, and they have their status. And that's not nothing. But don't be thinking that there isn't a price to be paid for that. You know, they don't see their families. They're often divorced. They don't see their children grow up. And, and they don't have time off. Now, there are wealthy, what would you call, playboy types, I suppose, who live out the dreams of wealth of a foolish 14-year-old, but they're not that common. And you have to be careful of what you're jealous of because you don't really know what it is. And, and then the other thing that's kind of useful is to, well, to understand that you're different from everyone else. And this is especially true as you get older. When, when you're 17 or 16 or something like that, comparing yourself to other people makes a certain amount of sense because 16 and 17 year olds, they're kind of the same, you know, which is why when you go off to university, you can make friends so quickly. It's like, I'm, I'm just about 60. It takes me like 15 years to make a friend now, you know, um, as opposed to the two months that it took when I was 17. Um, you're, you're quite different from other people and you shouldn't be comparing yourself to them because they're not like you, you know? They, they don't have your family. They don't have your temperament. They don't have your troubles. They don't have your abilities. The only person that... The only, the only person that has those is you. And this is why one of the rules, I think it's rule four, is compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. And see, that's a game you can win. 
because you could be a little better today than you were yesterday. And that's a good thing. You're a little better. That, that's a good thing. And, and, you know, no doubt there are some things that you could improve. You know, if you, if you sit and meditate for any length of time about what you're not doing optimally, answers will see you were when you went in. And that's happening in, at a small scale. time you learn something, you know, you, if you ever really learn something, it's usually painful. It usually means that you have to recognize that you're wrong in some important way. You have to let that part of you that's wrong die. And then you have to let yes. a new part of you. Okay, so the self, imagine that you undergo a series of transformations in your life. There are, there are collapses into the chaotic underworld and then re many resurrections. That happens continually. And that's what molds your character. Silicon Valley tends to be liberal, Every, everyone knows that, and the reason for that is that there's a tremendous number of entrepreneurs there, and entrepreneurs tend to be high in openness and lower in conscientiousness, so they're creative, but they're also willing to break rules, you know, which you kind of have to do yep. often, hopefully not to a criminal extent, but you have to, you, well, you know, it's tricky when you're trying to establish something new, because look at a company like Uber, you know, they had to bend the rules to, to be successful, and those companies that have rented those scooters out and put them on the streets everywhere. You know, they just kind of went ahead and did it. It's not something an orderly person would do because they'd ask for permission. Whereas the people who started these scooter rental companies just said, well, huh, what'll happen if we put them everywhere? And the answer was that seemed to work. But, you know, you have to have a rule breaking proclivity in order to manage that. Stop doing the things that you know are wrong, that you could stop doing, right? So it's, it's, a, fairly, it's a fairly limited attempt. First of all, we're not going to say that you know what the good is or what the truth is in any ultimate sense. But we will presume that there are things that you're doing that for one reason or another you know are not in your best interests. There's something about them that you just know you should stop. They're kind of self-evident to you. Other things you're going to be doubtful about, you're not going to know which way is up and which way is down. But there are things that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do. Now, some of those you won't stop doing for whatever reason. You don't have the discipline or maybe there's a secondary payoff or you don't believe it's necessary or it's too much of a sacrifice or you're angry or resentful or, or afraid, who knows? So forget about those for now. But there's another subset that you could stop doing. It might be little thing. Well, that's fine, stop doing it and see what happens. And what'll happen is, your vision will clear a little bit. And then something else will pop up in your field of apprehension that you will also know you should stop doing and that you could stop doing because you've strengthened yourself a bit by stopping doing the particular stupid thing that you were doing before. That just puts you together a little bit more. And you could do that repeatedly for, for an indefinite period of time. And, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to ever be able to formulate a clear and final picture of what constitutes the truth and the good. But it does mean that you'll be able to continually move away from what's untruth and what's bad. And you know, that's not a bad start. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about something. And usually what I'll do is go write it down. I have some writing to do. So I get up and I go write down what I'm thinking and that usually does the trick. But because I had been playing with YouTube, I thought, well, I'll try making YouTube video and, and telling people what I'm thinking about and, and see if that performs the same uh, function as writing. And to me, the function of writing, while it's twofold, one is conceivably to communicate with people, although the fundamental purpose for me is to clarify my thoughts so that I know, to, you know, because if, you're, if something is disturbing you, what that means is that 
It needs to be articulated. It, what, it's the emergence of unexplored territory, something that disturbs you. That, that's the right way to think about it. It's unmapped territory that's manifesting itself. It's like a vista of threat and possibility. And you need to articulate a path through it. And so that's what I was doing. It's like, I was thinking, well, this is bothering me and this seems to be why and here's what I think is going on and and so I made the videos and in some sense I, I didn't think anything more of it. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine, but it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward and the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering and that the pathway forward as far as the existentialists are concerned is by, well certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language, but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. And the thing that's so interesting about that is, well, two, as far as I'm concerned, and some of this is from clinical experience, you know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that Perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. My experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages, if you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not gonna last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stopped making things worse because...
that's another thing people do all the time. Not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. It isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million, and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected, and the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend, and it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters but I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. You now when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a lot easier than acting them out and the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you, and you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered, especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what it's like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends. Because that's what happened in the...